All right, let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I ask through your Holy Spirit that you would help me to, uh, to focus, to deliver your word, to do my best to let the word speak for itself. Um, I, we recognize as pastors and preachers and teachers that we're, um, we're implementing some interpretation and illustrations to help drive home what's in your word. But um, Lord, we need to do our best to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And so, Lord, I ask you to help me this morning, and I pray that you would help us all to see things anew, afresh, with fresh eyes, a new perspective. Um, Not that you're not continuing to reinforce things that we already know, but Lord, I believe that you are continually in the business of shifting things. If there are things that are wrong or thinking that is wrong about your word and about who you are and your character, I think that you want to correct those things. So um, just uh, balance that out in me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I got a little overwhelmed yesterday. I thought, what, what am I doing? How can I cover two and a half chapters in a Sunday and, and I plan on trying to get through three chapters on an, another Sunday in a few weeks, so this is really difficult. So I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try to really stick to the notes and stick to the Scripture um, to, uh, to get through this. If for some reason I don't, we're just going to have to carry it over uh, for a couple of weeks. We have uh, Pastor uh, Maurice McCarthy actually coming to speak next week. And, and I'm kind of liking this, you know, given a couple of weeks off, because it gives you time to, to catch up in your reading. Hopefully you're reading ahead, so you're prepared, so you have some understanding when you come here on a Sunday morning. Uh, so hopefully uh, we've given you enough time to do that. So real quick, I just want to recap where we've been. We've been studying through Romans. We're on Romans chapter 3, verses 21, and we're going to try to cover through chapter 5 today. I'm going to do my best to do that. Um, there... Paul uh, wrote this letter for many reasons. This isn't the only reason, but a common theme throughout the, the whole book of Romans. It seems like he's correcting these, these two factions in the church, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. There was some disunity there, some disagreement. Um, uh, the, the Gentiles were dealing with issues and the Jews were dealing with issues. And Paul was addressing these issues and uh, right off the bat, after his introduction, his long prologue, he gets into correcting them about some things. Um, he uh, starts off, you know, showing that all, all have sinned, and all have sinned equally, and all deserve the wrath of God. Um, sin deserves to be punished, and they are all sinful. The Jew and the, and the Gentile are all sinful, and they deserve the wrath of God. Um, he wanted to show both these groups that the only way that they can be part of the people of God was through the grace and faith of Jesus Christ, not by obeying laws and rules. The law was good, it was a tutor, but it's not enough to deal with this issue of sin. Um, it's, it's, it's a saving knowledge of Jesus, Jesus Christ, faith in Christ that makes, that makes a difference. That's, that's the solution for sin. Um, one of the major themes of the entire book of Romans is recorded in Romans 1, 5 through 6. I want to read this again. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Paul's going to make this point many times and drive this home throughout throughout the, the, the letter as we study through these chapters that God had a plan to save the Gentiles from the beginning of time. Um, it wasn't a plan B or plan C. Um, saving the nations was always on God's mind, and you can see that even in the Old Testament. While the emphasis tends to be around the nation of Israel, he was using the nation of Israel to manifest who he was and to manifest his glory through, through a nation. But he always desired to save all nations. And uh, uh, Paul's going to talk quite a bit about that as uh, we move, move through the letter. Uh, the, the thesis statement or, or the, the summary scripture that I'm using every, every Sunday, I want to start off with this. It's in Romans 1, 16 through 17. 
For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Um, so I gave the first Sunday, I gave an introduction into Romans, and then, uh, then we took two Sundays to go through part one and two of what I called God's wrath. God's wrath was to, to the ungodliness of the Gentiles is in Romans 18 through 32. And then part two was God's wrath to the Jewish, Jewish Christians or the Jewish people. And uh, he made a point that the law cannot save them. Uh, the written law only makes them aware of sin. So Paul is going to point out later in chapter 8 that there's a law that is working around us and within us to keep us in bondage to sin. It's like a virus or an infection that needs an antidote. And uh, we're going to actually get into that this morning, the solution for this problem of sin. Um, so we're going to start with Romans 3, 21 through uh, the, the rest of chapter 3. I'm not going to, by the way, I'm not going to read all, all these scriptures. I'm going to just give summaries of some of them. Um, but the, the really important ones, the substance of the, the passages, I'm actually going to read. So Romans 3, 21 through 26 is really about the, the center of the gospel, the center message of the gospel. Romans 4, 1 through 25 is about Abraham's faith. And then Romans 5 is about the hope in Christ. So there's a lot of words and phrases that repeat themselves. When you're reading through Scripture or studying Scripture, when you see a lot of words or phrases repeat themselves, you need to pay attention to those. You need to like dig deeper to understand what they mean. I've mentioned some of these words already, but they're talked a lot about in these chapters, so I want to mention them and, and give some definition to them for, for those that don't understand. Um, this, this word righteousness that's used, and uh, the Greek word is diko, diko osune. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Now, Google's wonderful. You can actually go and write, write these words, and they pronounce them in Greek. The problem is I've done that on a few different sites, and they pronounce them differently. So it's like, it's not totally reliable, but it's going to do a better job than I do. But um, this righteousness that's talked about in, in Romans is speaking of God's righteousness or salvation. It's the process by God to put people into to right relationship with him. That's why, that's why his son was sent. That's... That's the central message of the work of the cross. Something is wrong with mankind. Um, we, we, we can't enjoy a face-to-face -face relationship, like a garden relationship, like Adam and Eve before they sin, because, because sin is in the way. There's this problem of sin. And, and God needed to make it right, and, and he sent his son into the world to, to do that. So um, righteousness is the process by God to put people in right relationship with him, because God is the God of love, and he wants to draw close to us. And he wants to remove anything that hinders that relationship and intimacy with him. So that's righteousness. There's this word uh, justified, which is uh, very similar to righteousness. But uh, justified, I, I use this, this phrase, it means just as if I have not sinned. That's what justified means. So it's made right with God. Jesus cloaks us with his righteousness. Um, there's another word, uh, atonement. And uh, the Hebrew word is kafar, K-A-P-H-A-R. And it means to cover, to cover over. Um, it focuses on how people are brought into right relationship with God, a face-to-face -face relationship. Um, I mentioned that I was going to spend some time on different atonement views. I decided not to do that. There's a lot of nuance to it. And I think it actually just brings confusion. So that's why I decided, you know, I'm just going to stick to what the Scripture says. Um, I would like to talk about that in, in a, a little deeper at, a, at another time because there's a lot of other Scriptures that we can bring into that, but I'm just not going to take time to do that. I'm just going to focus on what Romans says, what Paul says about, about atonement. Uh, then there's this weird word, depending on what version you have, propitiation. Some of it, some versions say the sacrifice of atonement, um, but there's this funny word, propitiation, and it means appeasement. 
And I'll give more clarification to that in a second. So, I've entitled this uh, Romans 3.21 through, through the rest of chapter 3, The Restoring of the Garden Relationship. And I intentionally did that because God's trying to get us back to the relationship that he originally created mankind and enjoyed with mankind. He, he wants to restore that relationship. He wants to restore the garden. He wants to restore all things, not just mankind, but the world. Um, because everything has been corrupted by sin, and God's trying to fix this. Um, so I'm going to read Romans uh, chapter 3, 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned. That was the point that he was making in chapter 2 and 3. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. And they're justified by his grace as a gift. This is a gift that God is offering to us. You, you can't get it yourself. You can't. You can't get it by obeying all the, all the rules of the law, which nobody can do because all have, all have sinned, even Abraham, and, and Paul's going to make that point. Um, but uh, all are justified by grace as a, as a gift. This is a gift that God offers mankind. He initiated the gift. And this gift was provided through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. There's that weird word to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's kind of a strange phrase. I have to bring some explanation to that. You know, what what does this mean? Uh, so that he might be, a, be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Jesus showed that he was just. There's, there's words in Scripture that define the character of God. There's also words that describe you know, God's expression. It's a little different than words that, that define the character of God. Like, you know, Scripture doesn't say anger is God. Scripture says God is love. And because God is love, therefore God is just. He is the embodiment of those, of those things. There are other things that just describe you know, actions or reactions of God. You know, that doesn't necessarily define his, his character, but there are words that clearly define the character of God, and one of them is his love and you know, God being just. So God showed that he was just. It's the willingness of Christ's sacrifice for our sin made it possible for him to offer to us eternal life without leaving human sinfulness unpunished. Because all are deserving of the wrath of God and all have fallen short, or all have sinned and fallen short, sin brings a consequence, and one of the consequences is eventually death. There are other consequences of sin. We know that. We know some of those consequences. Some, sometimes it's sickness and disease or broken relationships. But ultimately, sin will bring death to all. That's something that was brought into the world that's not going to be remedied you know, until you know, Jesus returns and we receive a glorified body and never again will we experience physical death. But is, until Jesus returns, we're all going to get older and we're going to experience death. That's one of the consequences of sin. No one has the ability to make themselves right with God. We can't do it by obeying the law. Paul made that point. The law can't do it. Um, I wish bureaucrats would understand that. They think, you know, that if they just continue to make more laws, it's going to fix the problem. You know, that doesn't fix the problem. It seems to make the problem worse. The the thing that's going to fix the problem is changing the heart of a man. And there's only one thing that can do that. And that's the central thing that the church needs to be obsessed with. You know, instead of politics and, you know, things like that, those things are important. But the thing that's most important that, that a man's heart changes, and that's only going to be through the gospel. Um, you know, the Jews had 613 laws, and none, none of those laws made them righteous. And they broke them all, or a lot of them. 
Um, I do want to note that it's theoretically possible to be saved if someone obeys all the laws, but it's impossible for anyone to obey all the laws. So the law can't save you. So being made right with God, Romans 3.24 says, as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Jesus Christ. Um, every, you know, every other religion in the world is a religion of works. You got to do something to win the favor of that God. In Christianity, God does it. His, his son does it. And it's a free gift. That's, that's love. So how do we obtain the righteousness of God? The only way to receive this gift is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. I, I um, spent some time talking a little bit about faith in a class that we're doing on Wednesday nights, Michael, Michael James and I. And um, I was just really praying about and contemplating faith and what faith is. And I know the biblical definition of what, what faith is, but it's only one of those definitions, and it's not a complete one. When you break it down, faith is really a relational term. It's about intimacy with Jesus. Think about that. You know, every time you see the word faith in Scripture, when you think about intimacy with Jesus, faith is a relational term. So if you draw close to Jesus, if you have an intimate relationship with Jesus, there's incredible power in that. It produces all sorts of abundance in your, in your life and gets rid of, r removes lack. So I think, you know, when you see faith in Scripture, think of it about faith in Christ, a relationship with, with Christ. So what does Jesus' death have to do with the righteousness of God? Why did Jesus have to die? Have you ever asked that question? You know, there are some things that are really hard to wrap your mind around. I know the Scripture get, brings some explanation to things. You know, but I would have tried to find another way. Um, but Romans 3, 25 through 26 gives a pretty good explanation of it. So the why of Jesus had to die whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time. That's why Jesus had to die. When God forgives people, he does not treat them as they deserve. We, we deserve to suffer the consequences of sin, but... God doesn't want us to suffer the consequences of his sin, so he sent his son to take on the consequences of those sin. Um, this, uh, this verse might be just in the justifier. Basically means if God is not going to judge sin, if he's going to remove the consequence of sin, it brings God's judgment or God into question because God needs to, to deal with this, this sin issue. Sin deserves the wrath of God. That, that was the point that Paul was making in chapters 1 and, one and 2 and 3. And we want God to be just. You, there's this, this innate desire in all of us to seek justice, to see evil punished. I don't think we get too excited about it when it's in us. We don't want to be punished. But it seems to be okay if somebody else is punished for their sin and their evil. But there, there, there's this innate thing that's part of being created in the image of God. Justice and righteousness. Justice can't be separated from his righteousness. But justice and righteousness are really important to God. So if he's not going to punish, punish sin, then it kind of brings into question God's judgment. We want God to be just. We don't want people to get away with evil. So the cross answers this question. How can God be just and maintain his integrity and not deal with sin? Well, Jesus took the consequences of our sin. Notice what I said there. Jesus took on the consequence of our sin. We use certain expressions and words to define what Jesus did that are not in the Bible. And I'm not saying there's not some accuracy to it, so I'm going to address some, some things, some common language. I think what, 
what took me so long to put the, these, these notes together because I wanted to be re really careful to use different language than I've actually used before. You know, when you, sometimes when you grow up in the church, you learn certain things that, that you know, could be, they, they, they could be biblical, but you're using different language to define those things. And when you're talking about what Jesus did on the cross, I think these things, atonement and forgiveness, I think these are really important issues. So when we're trying to define this work of atonement, what Jesus did on the cross, I think it's really important that we use the language that is in Scripture. Because there are some words that we've tagged on to this, or phrases, or thoughts, interpretation, that I think is not quite biblical, and I'm, I'm going to address some of those things. So I think Jesus took on the consequence, consequences of sin. Therefore, removing our guilt. I don't believe that God poured his wrath out on Jesus because Scripture doesn't say that. You can believe that, but Scripture doesn't say that, and I challenge anybody to show me. I mean, it, his wrath is talked about, and, and you know, God's wrath is poured out on, on, on unrighteousness. You know, God you know, hates sin and hates evil and wickedness, and he wants to do something about it. But Scripture does not say that God poured his wrath out on his son. It remedied, remedied the issue of sin and the consequence of sin. But nowhere in Scripture does it say that God poured out his wrath, that he punished Jesus for our sin. And I know that might sound a little bit new, you know, to some of you, but I challenge you to, to search the scriptures over it and just kind of hear me out. Um, this word propitiation, I want to say a little bit more about it, and I actually want to read something. There's a good illustration in a, in a commentary, a book that I was reading that I want to share with you. Um, the Greek word for, for propitiation is hilasterion, I'll spell it. It's H-I-L-A-S-T-E-R-I-O-N. And it actually refers to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so you remember the Ark of the Covenant that was in the Holy of Holies in, in the temple. Um, for the forgiveness of the people's sins, the priests would go in there and they would sprinkle blood on, on the Ark on the Day of Atonement. And it represented how sins are forgiven and uh, on this ark was a, a seat. It was the judgment seat. And when the blood was sprinkled on the judgment seat, it actually changed the judgment seat to a mercy seat. That's, that's, what, that's the picture that you know, these, these first century Christians, particularly the Jews, were getting. Particularly the Jews. I'm sure the Gentiles figured this out. Um, but this is the picture that the Jewish Christians would get when they hear this word propitiation. And I want to read something. Um, this is from a book by Harold Eberly. And he was talking about this, this word propitiation or appeasement. He said, To see the function of propitiation, consider an example of propi propi propitiation from ancient times. Say that word five times fast. On various occasions, a king would become angry with the citizens of some city. So the king would come with his armies to conquer that city. If the leaders of the city realized, they, realized that they had no chance of winning the battle, they may have assembled a gift of gold or silver and then carried that gift out to the angry king. Sometimes if you, if you watch movies about you know, med medieval wars, this would happen if they knew they were going to lose or they were outnumbered. They would, um, they would negotiate, you know, so, so people wouldn't have to fight and people wouldn't have to die. Um, so this is that, that, kind of, that kind of idea. So they would assemble a gift of gold and silver, and then uh, th that would be carried out as a gift to the angry king. And if the king accepted the gift and his anger subsided, then the gift served as a propitiation. As a result, the king would change his mind and not harm the city. The king would take his anger out on this, would not take his anger out on the city or on the gift. He would simply accept the gift and leave without punishing anyone. 
I think that's a better picture of what happened on the cross. Jesus suffered the... Con- I mean, it's clear that, that he took on our sin on the cross. I mean, by those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think, I think, that's, I think Jesus, in his humanness and in his emotions, felt like he was forsaken. I, I think that that's he was taking on the sin of the world and he was... He was expressing, you know, what this was feeling like. I think it means more than that, but I think that that has something to do with it. You know, God is merciful for the one who has faith in Jesus. God is just, and he is merciful. Again, Christianity is the only faith where God is actually just and merciful. You know, some of the ancient gods and other religions I'm not even sure most of them are portrayed as being just. They, th- they seem to be more random. Um, but they know that they, ex- they exercise judgment. But the characteristic of mercy is unique to God. God can forgive. He does not have to punish sin. That's another concept that I think people miss most of the time. God does not have to have to punish people. God can actually forgive people. It's why he sent his son. You know, he, he's, he's able to show mercy. There are plenty of examples in the Old Testament of Scripture where God was merciful, that he didn't punish sin. He doesn't have to punish sin. So forgiveness actually means that a debt of sin has been erased. That's actually what forgiveness is. It's not that, you know, a debt was paid. It's more accurate to say a debt was erased. You remember, you know, Scripture says, I'm, your sins are going to be as far from the east or west. I'm going to remember them no more. It's God's giving you a picture of that sin that not just is a, a debt being paid. It's more accurate to say, I'm going to erase your sin and I will remember them no more. Um. I want to read a couple passages, one in Jeremiah and one in Hebrews, because I think it it gives a good illustration of what I'm talking about. Because I think the central message about the cross is an establishment of a new covenant. I think that should be our focus. Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Jeremiah was prophesying of what was going to happen, you know, with, with, with the cross and a new covenant that was going to be implemented. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The primary message around the cross, what what God was doing was establishing a new covenant, not just with the nation of Israel, but but all who would who would receive the faith of Jesus Christ, that would, that would make Jesus the Lord of their life. It was, it was about a new covenant that he was establishing. Hebrews 9.22, I'm going to read that first, and then I'm going to go back to Hebrews 9.15-16. Hebrews 9.22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That's why Jesus had to shed his blood, so that we can be forgiven. And verse 15 through 16 says, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called, called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where... A will is involved. The death of the one who made it must be established. See, it was about Jesus on the cross. His death, his life, his death, his resurrection was about mediating a new covenant. 
If you want to focus on anything, focus on that. Discover, discover that, you know, what, what, what that is for you. And that's what Jesus was trying to, to do on the cross. That was the important work of the cross, that, that we would be brought near because we would receive this gift of the Holy Spirit, which would change our heart. And, and those laws would actually be within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, chapter 4. Now we've got to remember that Paul just got done directing attention to the wrath poured out on God by God on the Jew and the Gentile because they're, they've equally sinned. Just as the Gentiles had no excuse because God is revealed in nature and it's very created things. You know, God has manifested who he is and what he, what he desires in, in creation. And he also made a point to the Jewish Christian that he revealed himself through the law. Now Paul's going to address two false beliefs about Abraham that the Jews had. The first one is Abraham obeyed the law and was justified by his works. And the second one is that Abraham is the father of the Jews only. So Romans 4, 1 through 3. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by his works, he is something to boast about. So in other words, if, if, if he was made right somehow by obeying all the laws, and the Jews actually believed that Abraham never sinned. So they believed that he obeyed all of the law that he never sinned, and that was accounted to him as righteousness. That's not what the scripture says. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was, it was counted to him as righteousness. So, I already said that, that they believed that Abraham had never, never sinned. He never disobeyed the law. Um, but the law actually didn't exist when... This was said of Abraham. In Genesis 15, 6, it says, And he believed the Lord, and, it, and he counted it to him as righteousness. This was actually before the law. So somehow, Abraham was made right, or made righteous with God, before the law even existed. And it says how? He believed the Lord. He had faith in the Lord. Paul is making that, that point to the, more to the Jewish Christians, but also to the Gentiles, that you, you are made righteous by your faith in Jesus Christ. And he's telling the Jewish Christians, you know, just like Abraham was made righteous because he believed, you can be made righteous because you believe and you must believe in the saving grace and have faith in Jesus Christ. So Abraham was not justified or made right by his works or his ability to keep the law, but by faith in Jesus. He was justified by faith. Um, there's this thought, and I think it's pretty accurate, but again, Scripture's not clear on it, so I'm going to tell you that. But I think oftentimes when the angel of the Lord appeared in the Old Testament, I think, and many other theologians think it was actually Jesus that appeared. So I believe that, that Abraham actually knew Jesus. You can at least say he had saving faith. It was saving faith because he believed God and that was accounted to him as righteousness because Paul is comparing that faith, that belief that Abraham has said, and, and, there's, and he's saying if you had that faith, then you would have saving faith. The second thing that they believed is that Abraham is father of the Jews only. Romans 4, 9 through 13. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. See, these Jewish Christians believed that circumcision was actually tied to salvation. That you can't be saved Unless, I mean, they were fine with salvation in Jesus, but they were saying, you still need to be circumcised. 
It's, it, it's like today when people, people say, you have to be water baptized to be saved. You know, Scripture brings correlation or between water b- baptism and actually circumcision, and neither of those things actually save you. Paul's making that point that it's not circumcision that saves you. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then is it counted to him? What was it before or after he had been circumcised? He, see, he's making that point that, that, that Abraham was made righteous before the law, before circumcision, which was a seal to say that you were part of the covenant people. It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. This is why we get water baptism. Well, water baptized, it's, it's a seal, it's a declaration that we've made Jesus the Lord of our life. But it's like circumcision. It's, it's a seal, it's an outward seal, a visible seal that we are part of a new covenant. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. This would trouble, I mean, it troubled many of these these Jewish Christians. This idea that their father Abraham, which they almost viewed as, you know, certainly those that didn't receive Jesus, he would be propped up like somebody like Jesus. He was their father. Now Paul is saying he's not just the father of those who are physically circumcised. Abraham is the father of the Gentiles also because of his belief in God and his promises to him. That's the point that Paul is making here. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Notice it didn't just say heir of one nation, Israel, but all nations. Abraham is our father also. We, we sing that song, Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and I am one of them. And so, well, I sang that when I was in Sunday school. You might not sing that anymore. Those who are younger like, and haven't been in church are just looking at me like, no, we're not familiar with that song, sorry. The Jewish Christians were fine with salvation in Jesus, but they were insistent on circumcision. This was dealt with by the other apostles, you know, particularly Peter. You know, this issue, this issue was circumcision. These Jewish Christians were pushing the circumcision and other things. They were saying they had to practice um, the, the different the different rites and participate in the different holiday, holidays and feast days, and and Paul was saying, uh, no, they they don't. Sins were forgiven, actually pre Christ. Jesus' sacrificial offering through his shed blood took on the consequences of our sin, and was, was primarily about the establishment of a new covenant. People are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. That is how they are saved. By nothing that the law tries to institute, the only way they are saved is by faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 4, 16 through 17, and it looks like I'm not going to get to chapter 5 today. Romans 4, 16 through 17 says, That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. All his offspring. Not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. He's saying this to the Jewish Christians. He's saying this to the Gentiles. I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, And in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Abraham was never just the father of the Jews. 
He was the father of many nations. Genesis 17, 3 and 5 says this. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of multiple of nations, multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you father of a multitude of nations. So all those who are in Christ are part of Abraham's family, and therefore recipients of the promises actually made to Abraham in the nations. Because he is our father. I'm not going to read Romans verses 18 through 25, but this, this talks about how Abraham's faith was illustrated. He, he believed and he, was, he became a father of nations. Um, he believed that his elderly barren wife would bear him a child. You know, when God made him a promise, Abraham believed it. Verse 21 says he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. And verse 24 says that if we have the same faith and we believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification, then we can be sons of Abraham. And Abraham can be our father. Because we have the same faith that Abraham had. We are made righteous. We are forgiven. We are restored in right relationship to God and receive great and precious promises. We live by faith and not by sight. Amen? Amen. All right. So uh, in a couple weeks, I don't know how I'm going to break this up now, but I'm going uh, to go through, through chapter 5. I think I can do chapter 5 and chapter 6 because they're kind of tied, tied together. Actually, the next few chapters are kind of tied together. But um, Paul explained the, the how to get saved, um, but God's not done. Paul's going to answer the question, now how do we live now that we have this saving faith in Jesus Christ? So uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about what it is to have a life in Christ. And that's what Romans 5 and 6 and actually 7 are about. Amen? <sighs> okay, good. Well, Lord, we thank you again for your word. We we know that this is a theologically rich and deep, deep book. Um, and there are, these are complicated passages. And I don't, I don't claim to have done a sufficient job. Um, I think it, it's going to take a lifetime to actually understand this. And still we're not going to understand it until we see you face to face. And everything's going to be clear. But until then, Lord, you, you, you call us to be, to study the word and show ourselves approved. You give us your word, so you want us to understand it. Make it, make it practical. Um, but Lord, I, I pray that you would continue to help us not to read Scripture through our filters or our preconceived ideas. That if there are things that you want us to see differently, give us a different picture. Lord, I want to personally give you permission to do that in me. Um, and let's let Scripture speak for itself. So again, Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had this morning. You're so gracious and you're so good to us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, for taking on the consequences of our sin and making things right with you, Father God. Now we are in right relationship with you, part of a new covenant. And it's a new covenant of grace, a new covenant of love, a covenant of mercy. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you.